Thanks for joining me for this episode of Deer Dirt. This week I'm going to talk about the three driving principles of habitat on the land that I own and the properties that I've managed over the years. And I, I do a little bit of uh, consulting. Not a, not a bunch, but uh, this is, these are some of the things that I really push for when I'm on site talking to a landowner. But I'm going to use our farm as an example of each of these three principles. Principle number one, every acre counts. You bought all of it, uh, you paid for all of it, it should all do something. It should either be making you money, um, creating habitat, or creating food. One way or the other, it should be productive on your property if it's a recreational, you know, if it's recreational land. Uh, principle number two is 5% uh, food. And this one can really uh, vary quite a bit because the situation that you're in might dictate that you don't need a full 5% or maybe there's a lot of deer in the area and not much food in other parts of you know, your neighborhood and maybe you need more than 5%. Uh, this should be the stuff that you plant that doesn't get harvested. I'm not talking about the, the tillable portion of the land that you own. I'm not talking about the stuff that the farmer puts in and then combines in the early fall. This is the stuff that is supposed to carry the deer through the hunting season, through the winter, and then in good shape into the next spring. 5% um, is kind of a basic starting point. We can come back and talk about it in more detail. The other one is the 80 acres max on water. So I've never had trouble with this one in the past. Uh, the farms that I've owned have had quite a bit of natural water sources on them. So I've never had to create a lot of water, but the biologists that I talked to have told me that it's super important that you don't have pockets on the land that you own or manage bigger than 80 acres without a water source because that makes that area less attractive and the deer aren't as likely to use that because they're going to need to you know uh, be around a little bit closer to a, a water source so those are the three driving principles um, every acre counts five percent food 80 acres max uh, water so let's look at the first one every acre counts Again, you bought it, they didn't give it to you, it needs to be productive. And if it's something that can be converted into a food plot, keep it you know, in, in mind for that. You know, If it's got the right soil composition, you can pull up soil maps and you can look at those. Um, if it's got the right degree of slope, again, you can go into the Hunt Stand app and you can look at you know, how much terrain, uh, you know, how steep the terrain is by looking at the topo lines on the topo map. Uh, there's ways that you can assess that without standing there looking at it. But the main thing is um, if you can't plant something on it for, for uh, either food or, you know, income would be, you know, obviously like a, you know, a tillable uh, crop that, that somebody would pay you a cash rent for or that you could, you know, sell at the local elevator, then it needs to be habitat. And there's a, a lot of different directions you can go when you're creating habitat. And I'm just going to talk about it really, really quick, what two of those options are, and then really focus in on, on uh, you know, what I think is most important. A lot of people like to do it quick, and they want to get switchgrass into the ground. They want to get that, you know, instant habitat, so to speak. Within a couple of years, you know, potentially, they've got something growing there. My experience with switch, switchgrass, and I've planted tons of it, on uh, farms that I've owned is that the deer don't use it as much as what people think they're going to. They pass through it. Uh, they don't really live in it that much. They may bed there some during the summer, but it, it's not permanent habitat. It's not the kind of places like the timbered, you know, edges and, and uh, areas with, you know, more of the standard, I would call it conventional uh, deer habitat. Those areas tend to get more use from the deer. So when I'm planting something that I want to be long-term, uh, I'm putting something in the ground that's gonna be permanent. Uh, so for me, it's acorns. You know, and, and I've talked about it a little bit, I think in a couple of episodes back about, you know, I'll take some of these marginal acres that are too steep for planting food on, uh, too steep for farming, and uh, kill the, the, the vegetation that's there, till it up, spread the acorns, and then come back and till those uh, acorns into the ground, try to bury them to the correct depth. So now I've got the, the background of my painting uh, made. You know, everybody starts with like this idea, this beautiful like 
blank slate. But when you're creating a painting or you're creating a work of art, you need a background. And my background is the uh, uh, oak, planting the acorns and creating the you know, oak timber. And nature has a way of making that more diverse than what you might think. You might be assuming, oh, we've got you know, this monoculture of oak that's gonna grow there, but it doesn't work out like that. You'll have pockets where the oak does, or the little uh, oak trees do well, and other spots where they just don't come in very well. In those spots, you can either go back in and plant maybe, you know, something like apples or, you know, pears, wild plum, uh, whatever, uh, or maybe, you know, a chestnut, you know, some chestnut trees, or you can just burn through it and just see what kind of native prairie comes in and takes its place. In fact, you could even go into those spots, I guess, and plant switchgrass. You know, I've not done that, but the point is uh, the background of the, the uh, acorn planting or the oak planting, that just becomes more of a starting point. It's not gonna be long-term. There's gonna be other stuff that fills in there. So that gives you a lot of flexibility uh, you know, in the future of what you wanna do with those areas. So anyway, that's, that's number one. Um, the uh, principle number two was 5% uh, food. And if the area where your, your uh, property is located has a lot of ag around it, um, you might be able to get by with a little bit less than 5%. Now this is the amount of land that's dedicated to food that doesn't get combined. So I'm not talking about the fields that either you or a cash rent farmer comes in and combines in early fall. I'm talking about 5% of the total uh, property that's available throughout the season, throughout the fall, into the winter. Uh, that's to me, 5% is kind of a basic starting point. And on my farm, uh, we've got 625 acres here. That would say we need, what's 5% would be 31 acres. Uh, I'll bet you we're coming pretty close to that. We're, we're getting pretty close to it. Maybe a little bit low, maybe in the 25 acre range. So eventually I'll have to add a little bit more uh, probably pull a little bit away from some of the crop fields that we've got growing there that are going to get combined. You know, pull an acre out of each corner of these fields or, or you know, whatever the case may be. But I'm going to have the ability long term to uh, make the 5% uh, standard or the 5% minimum. Uh, that's, and, and again, you're looking at, you know, this is, these are spots that you're just not going to combine. These are spots that are going to be there, you know, for the deer throughout the fall and winter, ideally. What we plan in those, we'll come back and talk about that in another episode. I mean, that's too much to try to cover here. Uh, that'll make a good subject you know, down the road. And number three is the 80 acre maximum on water sources. My farm, uh, coming back to this one as an example, there's a lot of old farm or old uh, stock ponds. And if you think about it, that might be one of the few really, really great benefits of buying a pasture farm is the landowner that had it before, he was really focused on making sure that his cows had places to get water. He doesn't want to be you know, having them all come to one corner, just like we don't want the deer to have to go all to one spot to, to get their water. He wants to keep the cows spread out. He wants to have it naturally so that he doesn't have to bring in water or drill a well and, you know, that's expensive stuff. So they create a lot of these ponds. You know, they'll take any kind of runoff area and they'll dam it up and they might have a quarter of an acre of water here, there, you know, scattered all around. So I've got, um, on a normal year, you know, not a drought year, but on a normal year, uh, more water than one per 80 acres. But if you don't, you know, there's ways to create uh, these water sources, these, uh, you know, ponds, man-made ponds. Uh, I haven't had to do it in most of the places where I consult that hasn't been a factor, but it is something to consider if, you're, if your property doesn't have uh, one water source for every 80 acres. Okay, so that really touches on the three driving principles of creating maybe the basics of, of a great uh, whitetail hunting property. And I'll come back later, as I mentioned, and dive in even more detail into some of these topics. You know, how do you create permanent habitat? Well, I talked about one way and that's the planet, but you also can take the existing habitat and make that better. And that's a super important part of the overall plan. I mean, habitat is really two pieces, the, the stuff you plant and the stuff that you improve. 
So we'll come back and talk about how to improve the habitat that's already there in a future episode. We can talk about you know, how to make water sources, how to make food plots, what to plant in them. This is all good stuff to talk about in the future on, on uh, more of these episodes of Deer Dirt. But I appreciate you joining me this week and uh, we'll see you right back here again in a couple more weeks for the next episode of Hunt Stands Deer Dirt.